I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us. I have the special privilege tonight of interviewing a friend of mine, Craig Keener, who is hands down one of the leading New Testament scholars of our day. We're going to talk about, he's written a four-volume commentary on the book of Acts, but even more recently, it actually officially releases tomorrow, has a one-volume commentary on Acts uh, with Cambridge Press. And I appreciate you sending me an early copy of this. And I have read through almost all of it. It's 600 pages, so it's scholarly, but it's actually very, very readable. You've done a wonderful job of summarizing things up for pastors and for students and for people who just want a little bit of depth in the book. So we're going to spend our time looking at the apologetic issues uh, of this and unpack it. And then at the end, if we have time, we're going to take some questions uh, for <coughs> Dr. Keener. So write your questions down and then feel free to add them in the comments as we get to the end. But first, if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button because we have some other interviews coming up like this related to apologetics and theology you will not want to miss. Well, one of the things I appreciate you about you so much, Dr. Keener, is you have a brilliant mind. God has just given you a razor-sharp intellect, unparalleled work ethic. I know how hard you work, but also you just have a heart for the church and for the lost. And I know a lot of that comes out of your experience being an atheist and then coming to faith. So would you start by sharing your story before we jump into the book of Acts? Sure. Uh, of course, you have a lot of conversions in the book of Acts, and some of them are pretty dramatic. Mine wasn't like the Apostle Paul, where, you know, he, he saw the risen Jesus, you know, fully. But, um, you know, I when I was an atheist, I was, at the beginning, I, I, I was pretty smug about my atheism. I was like, well, these Christians, they're stupid. I said awful things. I made fun of Christians mm -hmm. uh, to their face, even. But then, not all of them. I mean, some of them were just so nice, it was really hard to be mean to them. But <laughs> uh, but then, um, and then I started thinking about eternal questions. Reading Plato, I started thinking about the immortality of the soul. And I wasn't really satisfied with the way he argued for it. But I started thinking about, you know, what's going to happen when I die? And there was no meaning at all in my own worldview. And so I began saying, you know, if there's something infinite out there that also happens to be caring <laughs> enough, please show me. But I really didn't know if it could ever happen. But wow. anyway, some people brought me the gospel. I argued with them for 45 minutes. They weren't really trained in apologetics. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I argued with them. I walked off. But the Holy Spirit took it from there. And I was so overwhelmed with conviction from the Holy Spirit over the next hour or so that finally I just collapsed to my knees because it wow. was God was in the room with me and there was wow. no way I could I could deny his presence. That wasn't the kind of evidence <laughs> for which I'd been asking, but it was more real than and so finally I said, Okay, God, if I don't understand how Jesus dying and rising from the dead, how that makes me right with you. But if that's what you're saying, I'll believe it. But God, I don't know how to be made right with you. So if you want to do it, you'll have to do it for me yourself. And all of a sudden, I felt something rushing through my body like I'd never wow. felt before. I jumped up really wow. fast. And I was like, wow. You know, I'd always said, these Christians are foolish because they don't live like they believe there's a God. If I ever believed there was a God, I would give God everything. Wow. Well, I don't understand what just happened to me, but I believe there's a God now, and I'm going to give God my life. That That is beautiful. I love that you describe how these people weren't even always gracious to you in the way <laughs> they should have been, but God still used their efforts. And that's yeah. an encouragement to all of us. I love that story. And in, in fact, in some ways, it makes sense that you would love the book of Acts, which is about the Spirit, given that the Spirit of God filled you up at that point of conversion. Yes. So you've written commentaries on Romans, on Galatians, the historical Jesus, your recent book you sent me, Christ a Biography. But you spent a decade studying the book of Acts. Mm 
Tell me why you spent so much time in that book in particular. Well, I was hoping to finish the commentary in two years. At the end of two years, I felt like I needed just two more years. And it kept going like that. Okay. Uh, if okay. I thought it was going to take me 10 years, I probably would not have. But, but you know, some people criticized some of my previous books. They said, well, you know, you, you skip this issue, you skip that issue. So I decided, okay, I don't want to skip any issues. I okay. want to deal with them all. Uh, and even then, I mean, I couldn't deal with everything. 4,500 pages, like 45,000 extra biblical ancient references. Oh, my goodness. But, you know, I think with the secondary sources, I cited maybe uh, 10,000 or so, um, you know, modern scholarly works. But that may have been like half of what I could have unearthed if I, I mean, it just, there's so much available. Um, and then, and I loved Acts. One, one of the things was, you know, I, I do a lot with cultural background. That's why I did the background commentary. Yep. And Acts, you know, is just bursting with stuff where, where background is really important. Uh, who, who is uh, Herod Agrippa? Who is, who is uh, you know, this other person? So there was a lot of that, but also it's, it was very meaningful to me. Mm. Uh, my, my earliest, um, most of my earliest Christian life was spent in Pentecostal circles too, where Acts okay. is like so exciting. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and, and there's so much about the Holy Spirit in Acts and, and just, it's an exciting book. You know, Mark is what I'm working on now. And Mark, mm. you know, the theme is suffering. It climaxes in the cross. And that, that's become very dear to me as well. But Acts is like upbeat. It even has an upbeat ending. You know, it, it does. And, and it's about mission. It's about going mm. out and reaching the world for Jesus mm. and how the Holy Spirit empowers us to do that. It even kicks us off the seat of our pants sometimes uh, to get us to do it. When, uh, it does. Anyway, yeah. Well, I love it. Well, I've got a ton of questions for you. And maybe we'll kind of do these rapid fire, not like 10 seconds, but there's a lot of apologetic and difficult questions that come up. And one of the things that I read this and felt like I should have known this long before is that the story we often tell is that Saul changed his name to Paul at his conversion. But the conversion is first told in chapter 9. He doesn't really start using Paul until chapter 13 for a different reason. Can you explain yeah. that to us? Because Paul was born as a Roman citizen, he would have a Roman citizen name, uh, Tria Nomina, it's really three names, and uh, one of them, the, the cognomen that would be the one he'd go by, was Paulus, or Paul, mm. we say. And, you know, that's, that's not really something you want to go by in Jerusalem, but okay. when he gets out and begins ministering mm -hmm. among Gentiles, and especially among Romans, you know, They'd be impressed. Hey, this is a fellow Roman. He's Jewish, but, you know, he's okay because he's Roman. And so they would, you know, even if they didn't, you know, they were a little bit anti-Jewish, they, they could still listen to, to Paul. So it was, it was the appropriate time for him to use it to begin reaching uh, these Gentiles. That is really, really fascinating. Well, let's, let's jump into the dating of Acts. Now, one of the common apologetic arguments that is made is that Acts ends essentially with Paul on trial before he dies and before the destruction of Jerusalem. So just like if you had a history book written before that doesn't include 9-11, you'd assume it was written before. This doesn't include the destruction of uh, the temple, so Acts must have, must have been written before. Yet you don't accept that. Tell us why you don't find that compelling and when you date Acts to. <laughs> sure. F.F. F. Bruce was a major influence in a lot of people accepting that, but in the third and final edition of his Acts commentary, he actually changed his view regarding that as an insufficient argument in dating Acts after 70. So, you know, you can write a book where you're writing on a particular topic. Say if you're writing a, a biography of Martin Luther you can be writing well after 9-11, but you're not going to include 9-11. If you're writing a biography of Martin Luther King Jr., 
you probably won't say anything about 9-11 either because, you know, your story is going to end before you get to that point. If Luke is writing a history of Christian mission in terms of how the apostolic mission gets to Rome, he's got there in Acts chapter 28. He doesn't have to keep going. And especially if he wants to have an upbeat ending, you don't want to end on Paul's death, uh, which wouldn't actually be, you know, he parallels the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts a lot. Uh, but the book, the Gospel of Luke has an upbeat ending too. I mean, um, you know, Mark has this massive chapter on on Jesus' crucifixion and and just like eight verses afterwards for the, you know, the risen Christ. Luke has this massive chapter. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 24 is quite long um, about, about Jesus' resurrection appearances and so on. Very upbeat ending. And Acts also is going to have an upbeat ending after Paul's great danger at sea and, and so on. Um, the reason that I, I date it later, uh, you know, Mark 13, I, I date Mark before 70, okay. uh, well before 70, because, you know, Mark 13 if somebody were writing after the events, they would much more clearly differentiate between the destruction of the temple and the second coming. And, and in Mark, you can differentiate it, but it's not clearly differentiated. Okay. So unless you're after the fact, you wouldn't. But Matthew and Luke both make it very clear. I mean, in Luke, okay. you know, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, I mean, that's, you know, after seven, it, it's a perspective that makes sense after 70. So, um, it's true, those things could be prophesied in advance. I mean, and Moses could have written Deuteronomy 34 by prophesying his death in the third person in advance. Sure, because sure. <laughs> God can make those things happen. Yes. But it's not, the, it's not the simplest explanation for what we have there. And a lot of Acts actually looks like it's looking back on... Um, <sighs> Not only do you have Jesus predicting the destruction of the temple more than once, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Luke 19 as well as, as Luke 21 and so forth, but also in Acts chapter 21, Paul's final speech in the temple is almost a call to turn away from this strife with the Gentiles, this conflict with the Gentiles, because of where it's going. And after 70, that would really be meaningful to the audience. Now, that's not a sure reason to date it after 70. Sure. If you want to know why I don't date it later, uh, I can give you that also. Yeah, tell me. I'd be interested because I know the standard dating you say is kind of 70s and then a few in the 90s, but probably most in the 80s, most scholars would yeah. date it. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, and and, I, and I, I would I place it like around the mid-70s. Okay. <laughs> that's give or take a few years. I mean, it's, it's, it's an estimate. But, you know, the main charge against Paul in Acts chapter 24, verse 5 again, responding to which he needs to do apologetic, is mm -hmm. that Paul uh, has stirred up riots. He stirred up sedition, uh, mm -hmm. which was a capital charge. Mm -hmm. and, and Luke defends Paul against that charge, has these extensive defense speeches. Paul in Roman custody takes up the final quarter of the book of Acts, mm -hmm. uh, which is very relevant. I mean, your, your leader, Jesus of Nazareth, was executed on the cross, and now the leader of the diaspora mission, Paul, uh, has also been executed, or if it's, you know, before Paul's death that it's mm -hmm. being written, you say at least he's in Roman custody. So the final quarter of the book of Acts is dealing with that. And also, Luke reports all these riots surrounding Paul. Now, you're writing an apologetic to show that Paul didn't cause the riots. Why even mention the riots? I mean, we know from hmm. Paul's own list of sufferings in 2 Corinthians 11, Luke doesn't even mention a quarter of them. <laughs> he can only sample them. Why does he mention all these riots in these cities? Presumably because people remembered these riots. This is still fairly soon after the events. And, and so Luke hmm. goes to show that, no, Paul didn't cause these riots, but these are still, these are still fairly recent memory. And another reason I, I, I date it fairly early is because of the we material, which maybe we'll talk about later. Oh, yes. I definitely want to get into some of the some of the we material. In fact, let's just jump in and, and, and do it right now. We might as well. So the, the we material is 
some of the passages where there's more historical detail and it's argued that Paul is a companion or Luke is a companion of Paul, thus he has greater detail in those passages. Now, you write in the commentary that most scholars accept that. Can you can you unpack that for us and why that's so significant? Um, most being being a majority, um, not like a massive majority. This one okay. is kind of this one is pretty debated. Um, but the majority of scholars think that either Luke or his source in the Wee material was a traveling companion of Paul, and even detractors of that view, usually the ones who have researched it a lot, acknowledge that that that's a majority of of scholars to say that. Um, I think there's really good reason for saying that. Um, you know, Luke in these passages, starting in chapter 16 and verse 10, says we. Mm -hmm. And normally, we back then meant what we means today, <laughs> means, you know, I plus somebody else. And um, some people think it's a fictitious we. If you're going to make up a we, why not make it up at the empty tomb? Why not make it up at Pentecost? Mm -hmm. Why wait? And why just is a kind of a walk-on character, you know, uh, he, he's, he's there as a traveling companion with Paul. He's involved in the action occasionally, like helps interpret uh, Paul's uh, night vision in Acts chapter 16 and verse, uh, verse 10, uh, thereabouts. But, uh, and also, the, the we appears going going with Paul from Troas to Philippi. And then when Paul leaves Philippi, the we ends in mm -hmm. chapter 16. But when Paul comes back to Philippi in chapter 20, the we picks up again and follows him through the end of the book of Acts. Um, the, the we is not trying to emphasize his presence, but... You know, actually, ancient historians could could use either first person or third person or both. So, you know, Luke could have uh, could have said uh, I and then named the other people. But it was simply it was more simple. It was a greater economy of words to simply say we. So he's not emphasizing his presence, but he's including his presence. And whenever historians did that, they actually meant they were there. People have tried to argue against that, but I mean, I've read ancient historians. I mean, I think I've read, well, I, I don't know if I dare say all ancient historians, but <laughs> all ancient historians from this period whose, whose writings are extant in sufficient quantity that we can. Okay. But when they said, when they used the first person, they meant they were there. Okay. So, it, so if I understand you correctly, the we passages have more detail than some of the other passages, which makes sense if there was an eyewitness. It yeah. also doesn't seem forced, like he's setting something up. It's just for economy of words, to starts mm -hmm. using we and other times I. And when you look at other sources of the day, that's how language was used when you had a companion that came with you. Yeah, I mean... He, okay. he uses first person singular in his uh, uh, historical preface in Luke 1, 1 to 4. But he uses the first person plural uh, when he actually becomes part of the story in Acts 16 and then 20 through 28. Okay. Let, let's take a step back here for a second because this is a piece of a larger question related to Acts, namely its historicity. Uh, tell me if you are going to assess this as a scholar compared to other ancient writings at the time. How would you? How much confidence would you say we can have in the Book of Acts purely as a historical document? Oh, by the standards of ancient historiography, major confidence. When I okay. say ancient historiography, they wrote in a different way than modern historians did, but you take those things into account. Yeah, major confidence. Okay, that, so if you look at history today, would you lower that, or is that just an unfair comparison to ask about Acts compared to the way history is done today? It's, it's an unfair comparison in the sense okay. that um, you, you just have to take into account the differences of what to expect. Mm 
So in ancient historiography, you could have speeches. Nobody expected them to be verbatim. You yep. did your best to reconstruct the substance of what the person would have said, okay. depending on how much information you had about what they what they did say. Uh, but you know those kind of things. If you take those into account, yeah, it's it's you can have major confidence in it. Ancient historians talked about their trade that they were supposed to deal in facts and not make things up. Very different from another narrative genre, namely epic poetry. Uh, so like the Iliad or the Odyssey, yep. other major works of antiquity. And, they, they, you know, they made that distinction. Uh, history and biography were on, well, were supposed to be on that side of the continuum. There were some who took a bit more liberties. But in this period, um, and especially with the, the norms that were expected, um, yeah, you, you would expect it to be. Okay. And, and, and it wasn't just historians who said this, it was also orators and others mm. speaking about historians, saying this is what they're supposed to do. Somebody veered from that too much, their peers would rip them to shreds. They would call them <laughs> on it. In ancient history, I've seen you write that a number yeah. of times, that there was a kind of peer review built in. Yeah. For those who are just joining us, we are talking about uh, Dr. Craig Keener's latest uh, commentary on Acts, with Cambridge, it officially releases tomorrow. And I've almost read all of it, and it's very readable, very well researched. Just an excellent tool for pastors, for apologists, for students that want to go a little bit deeper. So you said we can have major confidence in Acts as a historical source. Tell me, just kind of broadly speaking, what are the big categories and areas that you would say gives you that kind of confidence compared to other sources of the day? Sure. I mean, one of them is it's writing fairly contemporary history for which the expectations for historical reliability were considered very fairly high. Um, another, you've got the eyewitness material, the, the we material. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. you know, he had direct contact with this movement. And the we material shows that he spent up to two years in Judea which would have given him plenty of access to material for his first volume, in addition to be able, able to use Mark and some of the other, you know, he mentions a number of sources available to him in Luke chapter one, uh, ability to consult eyewitnesses, and, but especially dealing with acts. You know, if he's a traveling companion of Paul, he's probably heard these stories more than once. Uh, mm. Paul tells some of the stories in his letters and we have overlap. In fact, we can make a lot of comparisons between Acts and Paul. And also, especially once it gets out into the diaspora, but even, even in Jerusalem, a lot of the material we have in Acts can be tested archaeologically. It can be tested, uh, you know, the, the, the temple, the, the, the steps in the outer court uh, that you have in Acts 21 and so forth. A lot of it can be tested with regard to what we know from external historical sources. Um, the Sergii Pauli are, are attested in the, the region of Asia Minor where Paul went next after meeting Sergius Paulus. Mm -hmm. Probably no coincidence, even though Luke doesn't, doesn't directly make that connection. Um, he, he not only gets correct the local titles of leaders in various cities, which you know, somebody would have to travel to the cities to get that. So, hey, maybe his source, Paul, did that. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, he gets correct the names in the right period. I mean, Gallio was governor of Achaia for about one year, didn't even serve out his full two-year term. But at the time that an inscription shows that Gallio was in Corinth, that's when Acts 18 places Paul before Gallio. Uh, same with Felix and Festus. I mean, so many of the details fit together. Felix, over the course of time, was married to three different princesses. But okay. uh, we know this from Josephus, and I think maybe Tacitus mentions some of that. But um, Tacitus definitely mentions Felix. But um, Josephus mentions they had three different uh, wives at different times. The one at precisely this time was Drusilla. Who's the one who's mentioned in this narrative? Wow. wow. I, mean, I mean, so many things fit, and the people, their character fits what we know about them from other sources, too. Obviously, everybody writes from a different perspective. And, you know, Paul, 
in his letters is writing about his experiences from a different perspective than Luke is. Mm -hmm. Nobody says Paul wrote the book of Acts, but uh, but it's, you know, the, where we can test it, um, you know, it's 2,000 years later, so we can't expect every detail to be verifiable. We can't expect every detail with our best reconstruction to match. But given, you know, comparing it with other sources, even comparing it with Josephus, I mean, Josephus mm. makes a number of mistakes, contradicts even himself at times. But we have, um, in, in, in what we have in Acts is even more, uh, I, w I would say, I, I would trust Luke uh, up against any ancient wow. story. That, yeah. that's, that's excellent to hear, given how much time you've studied with this. Um, yeah. I want to give a shout out. We have Tony all the way from Australia. Nice to have you. Leslie, good to see you from our program at Biola. He does our apologetics program. Uh, just doing great work and so many others. We're going to get to some of these questions as we get to the end. But let's talk about jo uh, Josephus for a moment. A couple weeks ago, I had a debate on the apostles with kind of a, a popular YouTuber, really nice guy. And he made the claim that Luke probably borrowed from Josephus and copied from him. And two things hit my mind. Number one, I said, well, if he did, then it seems that that would be credit towards him because he says he uses many sources and Josephus is a good source. But I'm pretty sure that's a really fringe position. How many people accept scholarly and do they have good reasons to think the book of Acts was borrowed from Josephus? In terms of how many, it, it depends. As of a few years ago, when Richard Purvo, who, who holds a second century date for Acts, when he wrote about um, summarizing the different positions, between 60, well, no, between 70 and 90 was the majority position. Uh, the 60s was the second leading position. Okay. The 90s was the third leading, and the second century was the smallest. Now, since that time, the second century has grown. Um, not sure if that's been more at the expense of the 90s or which, but um, the majority of scholars still date Acts too early to be dependent on Josephus. Now, the places where he's most often alleged to be dependent on Josephus. And I apologize because the sun coming through my window, oh. <laughs> it looks like I'm, I'm being transfigured slowly before you, but it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know a way to fix that. Maybe. If, you know now. what? You're fine. We're talking about acts. So I just assumed the Holy spirit was just descending on you, Dr. Yeah, Keener. I don't so know. it is, it is no problem at all. Or, you know, uh, or <laughs> tongues of fire. But anyway, um, but the, the places where Luke is supposed to be most dependent on Josephus, they actually don't agree with each other. Mm. And so, mm. <laughs> um, and, and here's the other thing, for even alleging dependence on Josephus, I, I mean, there, there's a ballpark core agreement, but that should be what you would expect unless Josephus is making stuff up. If Josephus isn't making up these events that he's narrating, then then the history of these events can also be available to other people who lived in that area. Luke could have gotten it from mm. other oral or written sources. He doesn't have to depend on mm. Josephus, whose publication actually, even, even once he publishes his material in the 90s, it takes time for it to get out. It circulated first among the elite. So, yeah, I would... Yeah, I think Luke is writing well before Josephus. Okay, that, that makes sense. That's, that's really helpful. Um, how much confidence can we have that Luke is actually the author of Acts? What we have from the we material, I mentioned earlier, there's an eyewitness. Um, and and I'm, I'm pretty strong on that. I think that most mm -hmm. of the people who deny that, I mean, I know, okay, and some things I speak with scholarly consensus. So in this one, I'm speaking just, um, this is me. Okay. <laughs> but I really agree with Sir Arthur Darby Nock, Harvard classicist, one of the leading classicists of the 20th century, hmm. who who's said he could think of at most one source in, in historical work that, uh, that uses a first person in a, in a fictitious way. 
I mean, yeah, okay. fictitious works use first person fictitiously, but not not historical works. And the strong majority, I, I could say this is a pretty strong consensus. It's it's not absolute, but the strong majority of scholars take Acts to be a historical monograph. Yep. So if 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 you know he's using first person, so you've got an eyewitness there. The style is really no different. Some people have argued contrary to that, but most of us think the style is the same as the style elsewhere in Luke Acts. And so that means you've got the same author of the we material is the same author of the book. Now, gotcha. if you go through Paul's lists of those who were with him at the times that are described, uh, it pretty much narrows it down to who it could be who's not already named in the book separately. Now, if it, you know, sometimes they did use third person as well as first person, so you could maybe say Timothy, but apart from that, uh, maybe Titus is not named, mm. uh, but the, the, the most likely one is Luke. Nobody in the second century, when, when the gospels were under attack, had reason to make up a non-apostle as an author gotcha. for gospels. So it just makes sense that the uh, the church preserved, and within living memory of, of Luke's writing, preserved Luke as the author. Uh, I think that makes sense. I mean, where I'm firm is it's an eyewitness, but process of elimination, it makes perfect sense that it's Luke. Okay, that makes sense. Here's I'm going to jump to a question because this relates to what you shared. This is from Jose, and he says, what does Dr. Uh, Keener think? of the theory proposed by Dennis McDonald that Mark and Luke and Acts use Homer's Iliad to fabricate stories. Dennis is my friend. Okay. Dennis, <laughs> Dennis is brilliant, very creative. So please don't take this as denigrating Dennis, but here I can speak for scholarly consensus, I think. The vast majority of scholars okay. do not agree with him on this. Okay. Um, I, you know, I work through the different parallels for for Acts, and s sometimes, I mean, like like where um, Eutychus falls out the window. Uh, I I had already noted the the story in in the Odyssey where what was it? Uh, Eupenor, Elpenor, somebody somebody falls out, breaks his neck, uh, as an example of. People understood that if you fall back then far enough, you break your neck. Um, but that's not the only case in ancient literature. So most of the parallels he cites are instances where we could cite a whole lot of analogies okay. from an ancient literature, historical as well as fictitious. Um, but where we can test Luke against historical data, it fits in almost mm. every case. Mm. And what that suggests to me is, you know, Luke didn't know what ancient documents were going to survive 2,000 years. I don't think he expected the world to be here in this case, in, in this way in 2,000 years. Sure. If, you know, if Luke is accurate where we can test him, we ought to expect he's probably mm. equally accurate in the cases where we can't. Mm. That, that's really helpful, and I appreciate you bringing it out in the commentary multiple times. Sometimes when I have the documentation, sometimes when I have the archaeology to check, but when we do, he consistently matches up uh, with what we actually find. By the way, it looks like you have a beard right now because the sun is coming through below your nose. Yeah, so, you want to make it consistent, I'll just... Oh, now you look like a, a ghost almost when you're down <laughs> like sorry. that. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, we we can still hear you. We'll we'll work with you. It is what it is. We're all adapting it's, with this. this uh, oh, there we go. That actually. Oh, except I don't want you to have to hold your hand up the whole time. <laughs> yeah. That'll give you a workout. Um, Sorry. We'll, we'll just keep going as long as you you can see and you're fine. What one of the questions I have? I know you've done a ton of work on miracles. Obviously, two volume set that is brilliant. Recommend to my students at Biola all nice. the time. Um, would you say? specifically when there's, let me take a step back. One of the objections to the miracles is that people say, well, it's just like magic. And we see in Acts 19, this case where people are trying to use the name of Jesus as if it's a kind of magic. What are the basic differences between the miracles and the signs we see in Acts and beyond and what magic would look like? 
that was actually part of Luke's apologetic, I think, because you've got a uh, contrast with magic with Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, verses 5 to 13, and um, the uh, uh, Magus um, Elemus Bargesus in Acts chapter 13, verses 5 and following. Um, you've got, uh, and, and then of course, Acts 19 with the seven sons of Sceva. So uh, in, in all those cases, actually in, in antiquity, when they were trying to decide, well, this is magic and this is a miracle, um, often they started with the premise, if it's on our side, it's a miracle. If it's on the other side, it's magic. But, but they also had some more maybe objective criteria. Okay. If, it's, if it's private and it's for the person's own benefit and aggrandizement, then it's magic. Uh, if, it's, if it's public, um, then, it's, then it's a miracle. But in the case of, of uh, Acts and the, the miracles that take place there, oh boy, there's like lots we could say. Most of the, most of the miracles there, they're, they're not things that would be, that would just, uh, they're, they're not meant to give the person money. They're not getting rich off it. Gotcha. That's, that's one of the contrasts. Um, and also, they're 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 benevolent. They're helping people. They're okay. you know, ancient magic curses were a big part of it, <laughs> and love magic, getting somebody to you know exploit somebody. Uh, healing was just a small part of that. So, uh, what we have in in Acts and in the Gospels is benevolent, and we still have accounts of these things, eyewitness accounts and medical documentation for many of these mm. accounts happening today as well. S same, same kinds of things that we have in Acts. Okay, good, that's, that, that's helpful. Let me go, to, there's a couple questions coming up here. Um, it says, do you Excuse think me. the speech, oh, there we go. That, that oh, helps, that helps a little bit, much. that's good. Yeah, that's fine if, if you can uh, do it. <laughs> let's see, put my yeah, chair just, down. Do, do your best. We'll, we'll work. Oh, now you're completely. Oh, that, that, that's worse. Completely okay. uh, faded out right. white like a ghost. Right. Um, maybe if you rotate 45 degrees, I'm being told if here. I, now if I there stand, we go. Okay. Can you still hear me over here? We can hear you fine. I just want you to be comfortable. It's fine. Um, but that's great if, if, if you don't mind. Um, so let me ask this one. It says, you think that the speech given in Acts 5 by uh, Gamaliel was made up by Luke. Or did he get that wrong? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, now when I said <laughs> we can check things out, remember I said almost everything. I didn't say everything. So by the criteria that we would normally use for evaluating historical sources, this would be one of the, one of the few exceptions, and actually okay. the most blatant exception in the book of Acts. You've got another one that's probably on this level in Luke chapter 2. Um, it doesn't affect the substance of the story. Um, it doesn't even affect the point of the speech. But it is interesting that this one, well, this is one of the contradictions with Josephus. And I mentioned earlier, Josephus is sometimes wrong. So, you know, if we're coming at it from the standpoint of we believe this is divinely inspired, we may say Josephus was wrong. However, if we're coming at it just from the standpoint of purely historical secular evidence, um, most of the time we'd say Luke gets it right. This is one of the few times where, you know, we, we, we can't say that based on secular historical okay. principles because we would tend to accept Josephus on this since it's his special interest. But it's one verse or two verses. It's uh, 38 okay. and 39 of Acts chapter 5. And Interestingly, it's in the speech that's behind closed doors that the mm. apostles weren't there to hear. Now, it was given by the teacher of Paul. So Paul presumably would have known of this later on. And so Luke could have known this had to do with, you know, revolutionaries comparing Jesus to revolutionaries. But the sequence is different from what you have in Josephus. It's been addressed a couple ways. Some people say, well, it was a different Thutis. 
because Thutis was a common name. Unfortunately, Thutis was not a common name. <laughs> so I don't think that that, uh, personally, I'm not persuaded by that. Um, I, I'm open to Josephus being wrong, but on, you know, just start, just coming at it from secular historiographic grounds, this is not one of the places where we can verify Luke okay. on this detail. But it's, again, it's a speech and it's behind closed doors, which is the least place you would expect an ancient historian to get it exactly right. They had more flexibility there than anywhere else. He could just be saying, okay, here, here are some examples that you may have heard of. So in sum, as a whole, when we can confirm Acts, you find that he can, Paul, Luke consistently gets it right. But there's a handful of examples yes. that the questioner asked where we can't confirm. And historically speaking, we just don't know. Um, yeah, that seems to be a very, good. that seems yeah. to be a very fair, honest response with a book yeah. um, th this long ago. I think that that's totally fair. Uh, one question, I, I've got a few other ones for you, and then we'll come back the last 10 minutes. I see some good questions coming through, and we'll address these. But one question I want to ask, you know I did my, my doctoral dissertation on the death of the apostles, and your book on James was very helpful. Uh, or y Your book on Acts, where you mentioned the death of James. How much confidence would you give in his death, cited in Acts 12 to, historically speaking, and, and why? Oh, I think, I think we have good evidence for that. I mean, you have uh, Peter and John and James, the brother of Jesus, mentioned in Paul's letters. But you, you don't have this James. And, of course, James in the New Testament, it's really uh, Jacobos, which is Yaakov, which is Jacob. <laughs> uh, but I don't know if King James wanted his name in the Bible or how we ended up with James. But, um, but James, uh, G Jesus talked about uh, James and John dying. Uh, that's in the gospel tradition. Mm -hmm. You might expect they would die together, but, but John apparently lived a long time afterwards. But James, even though other leading figures among the apostles appear in Paul's letters, this one doesn't. He, he was already dead. And you wouldn't expect them to make something like that up. Um, when, I mean, this is one of their major leaders. You know, kill off one of the minor characters, not one of the, sure. one of the major ones. Okay, that, that makes sense. I thought it's interesting when you compared and contrast Stephen's death which you think is historical, but is very much patterned after the death of Jesus for theological reasons. But then the death of James is just reads like a straight mm -hmm. execution account, not flowery at all, reads historical. That was that was my, my assessment of it. Uh, give me a sense of how the book of Acts describes or doesn't describe the deity of Christ. So I know you make references to Acts 1.8, 2.27, 20, 20.28. You can take one or all of those. But do you think Acts teaches a divine Jesus? Yeah. Now, twenty twenty eight, uh, the, the speaking of the blood of God, that is, the, there are textual variants there that throw that into some question. But okay, you know, in Acts one eight, you should be my witnesses in a context that's based on Isaiah. So he's echoing Isaiah, where the Lord God says, "You should be my witnesses." Mm. Uh, and then in Acts two seventeen. And 18, um, quoting Joel, God says, I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. And then it goes on to say, and so Jesus has poured out the spirit. Okay. And of course, in, in the Old Testament, it often, the prophets often spoke of God pouring out the spirit. But you don't have God, uh, anybody else besides God who could pour out the spirit of God. Only God can do that. <laughs> and so... Um, and also you have in um, Acts 2, um, 21 or so, mm -hmm. he's, he's, uh, he's, been, he's quoting from Joel. He breaks off the quote from Joel at this point. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And the name of the Lord there is uh, YHWH in Hebrew, <laughs> um, so it's the Tetragrammaton, it's the divine name. Peter quotes that and then goes on to argue that the name of the Lord in which you're to call, and in 238, he, he climaxes that by saying, uh, repent and be baptized in the name of this one, is Jesus. Mm. 
and and you have you have other other things through there where, where Paul experiences the theophany of Jesus in Acts chapter chapter nine, and uh, Jesus Jesus says, you know, you're persecuting me, uh, w- which fits what he said earlier in the gospel. Whatever they do to you, they've done to me, uh, and they've done to the Father who sent me. But it's also language that was used in the Old Testament, uh, okay. where they. Yeah, anyway, I'm talking to. Yeah, so no, no, th- th- this is fantastic. So, like John, for example, the I am statements. It's clearly about the identity of Jesus as the Son of God. And you could argue Mark is a- as well. Acts oh, yeah. is about the advance of the church, but it indirectly points out that Jesus is God because things done in the name of God in the Old Testament are now done in the name of Jesus because yeah. he is the same God. Is that fair? Did I capture how Acts portrays Jesus? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. and, and again, taking it as a whole in light of the clearer statements, that sheds a light on the on the rest of it as well. Okay, that, that that's great. Let me ask you a couple more theological kind of cultural questions. You talk about a few times in your commentary, and again, those of you who are just joining us, we are talking about Craig Keener's new commentary that releases tomorrow on Acts. It's the New Cambridge Bible Commentary. So it's his four-volume commentary put into one, very readable, very understandable. I'm almost through it and have enjoyed it immensely. Uh, but one of the things that you point out here and in the other commentaries is that Luke has a concern for diversity. Now, clearly, he wrote this long before the present concern and talk about diversity. But could you tell us why that's such an important project that just appears so many times in the book of Acts? Sure. I mean, in a sense, it's what Acts is about. Acts is about mission, Hmm. uh, cross-cultural mission. The Spirit empowers us for that. Jesus is commissioning that at the end of Luke's gospel. And you have hints of it throughout Luke. I mean, when... Uh, Simeon speaks of the light to the nations using the language of Isaiah 42 and 49. Okay. But uh, Acts really focuses on that. And you find out that even the leading characters, some of them are reluctant. I mean, Peter has to be <laughs> uh, kind of pushed across those barriers and then has to lead the Jerusalem church across those barriers. And uh, the, the mention of the Spirit is, is strategic in that. Uh, the Spirit is poured out on all flesh, and the implications of that all flesh are fleshed out as the as the book goes on. And in 2.39, to you, to your children, to all who are far off, you also have um, the Spirit in, in 8.29 telling Philip, go up to that chariot. Uh, mm-hmm. And you have the, the African court official from the kingdom of Moroe. And uh, the, he's actually the first Gentile Christian. You, you, you have... Uh, a proselyte from Antioch in Acts chapter six, uh, around verse five. Then you have, okay. uh, th- then you have this uh, this guy who can't be a full proselyte because he's a eunuch. And then uh, in chapter ten, you have a full Gentile, and there the Spirit speaks again. Uh, in uh, ten nineteen, I believe the Spirit says to Peter, okay. uh, "Go down, meet these people. I've sent them to you." Uh, uh, 1528, where the Spirit says, uh, or, or they, they say at the Jerusalem Council that the uh, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Mm-hmm. We're not going to require circumcision for, for Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Um, so God is the one who's pushing this Gentile mission. Um, and, you know, it goes from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, Acts 1.8. And he, you know, even in even in Acts eight, when you have the Samaritans uh, who respond to Philip's message, and it says the apostles came and laid hands on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Well, the significance of that is that in Luke's pneumatology, in Acts chapter one and verse eight, when when the Spirit comes on you, you'll be witnesses. Yeah. So, in other words, they were receiving power not to be okay. You are our mission churches. We are supervising you. No, they're receiving power to become partners in the mission, partners in ministry. So what we have uh, throughout the book of Acts is this cross-cultural um, hmm. direction of the Holy Spirit, not requiring circumcision. No, we're not, we're not subjecting you to our culture. 
We're saying whatever culture we go into, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be united. And Paul took a really strong stand for that. that that's beautiful. And it's remarkable to see 2,000 years ago that when the church expands, there's a heart and a vision for diversity and seeing it as good. So I, I love that you brought that out multiple times in the commentary. Here's a question from one of our, our students at Biola that was actually on my list. Uh, how do you make sense of the three different conversion accounts? I believe it's Acts 9, uh, 22, and 26 about Paul in Acts. And some say he saw, some say he didn't say, heard, didn't hear. Is this a contradiction? How do you reconcile these apparent discrepancies? No, these are the, these are the kind of minute details that ancient historians didn't worry about. You know, you compare ancient historians, you can you can see this. The same historian writing about the same event multiple times. I mean, Luke doesn't do it nearly as much as Josephus. Josephus, okay, for, for in, in two different books uh, where he's recounting the same event, he'll make up two different speeches for the same <laughs> the same person. Interesting. So, yeah. So so these are these are minor things. Now. There are ways people have found to harmonize them, to, to reconcile them. They're possible, but again, they're not things that I think Luke would have worried about or his audience would have worried about. Mm. Uh, you can see that even between Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1, uh, where you know he's, he's giving the promise of the Spirit, he's giving the commission. Now, this could be two different occasions, but it's also true that uh, often you would end a book and 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 begin the, the sequel to the book with the same scene, uh, picking oh, up where you. Uh, so, but the wording is different. But I mean, that the issue in ancient historiography was getting the core. So mm. that's the standard that we look for there. They didn't have tape recorders, even in societies where we talk about, um, you know, somebody they'll recite these long poems, you know, for hours in length, and they say they do it verbatim. But once you introduce tape recorders or videos and you, you tape them, it's not what we call verbatim. But, you know, until it's in print or until it's recorded, the standard of verbatim is different from what we mean by verbatim. Uh, it, it simply was not expected in ancient sources. So you would take the position, I realize this is a theological question, but you would, you would take the position that we should judge these speeches by the goal and purpose and intent for which they were written, given the audience, the length, and the genre. So if there are surface differences, this doesn't take away from inerrancy because their point is not to describe it in the kind of precision, wooden way that some inerrantists take it. Is that is that yeah. fair to your yeah. position? Yeah. Yeah. But... But um, but also keep in mind I'm speaking of minor differences. Okay. Like you know some heard and the others didn't. Um, that's that's a minor thing. Um, and again there are answers for that. I'm not taking a position on that. Sure. I'm just saying by normal historiographic standards that's gotcha. that's a minor thing. I'm not saying you know the core event is not is not solid. Um, you know, it, it corresponds, and Paul speaks about his own conversion too. And from what we see in Galatians, you know, the areas near Damascus, and I mean, so much of it we, we actually can corroborate from, from the other sources. So, um, yeah. And, and, and also, like, I mean, some of the things people call conflicts are not really conflicts, they're just differences. Differences. You know, okay. so, so one talks more about Ananias than another does. That's not a conflict, that's just a difference. Gotcha. That's a great response. Pedro says, does Professor Keenan work on other books of the Bible or only in Acts? And he does. He has a commentary on Galatians that came out recently, working on a commentary on Mark. And I just discovered you have a commentary on Romans from 2009. I'm going to have to get that. So he is pumping out material faster than anybody I know. And a lot of that is his work ethic and just love for the scriptures. Um, one more that I want to ask you is, how does Acts portray women? Is it positively? Is it patriarchal at times? How does it portray women? This is something that's debated. I don't know exactly why it's debated, because it seems to me fairly obvious. I mean, Mark already gives a higher place to women 
than you would expect from average in average ancient historians. Luke takes it even further uh, in his gospel uh, as well uh, as in the book of Acts. If he has a story about a man, he'll often have a story about a woman, you know, he'll, he'll parallel them. Um, now, women do bad things in Acts too. I mean, you've got Ananias and Sapphira <laughs> and so on. But also, like Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Mm. So he's quoted from the book of Joel, but then you see it fleshed out in Luke Acts. So, for example, uh, Simeon and Anna <laughs> in Luke chapter 2. Uh, and then you have uh, Philip's four daughters who prophesy in Acts chapter 21, along with Agabus, the prophet, in that chapter. Um, so, so women... Uh, Luke, Luke often mentions women. He's, he's positive about women, uh, often speaks of women converts like Lydia uh, and, and the women who were with them in ways that weren't considered as worthy of attention in, in many ancient historians, unless they were high-class women. Of course, people of the high class uh, were always considered important by their peers. Sure. Uh, most historians were. Sure. I, my, my friend here, Samuel, is in Barcelona, where I think it's the middle of the night. You joined us. I saw your comment on Twitter, so we're thrilled Thanks. you're with us. Thank you for, for taking time. One, one final question. You mentioned that you don't hold the view that your friend uh, McDonald does, that yeah. the writer of Acts has borrowed from these uh, kind of Greco-Roman sources. But how does Acts use the Old Testament? Do they feel free to restate things, take it out of context? Do they search for stories to fit this narrative they believe about Jesus? This will be our final question, but I'd love to know how you think he uh, used, the book of Acts uses the Old Testament as a source. Sure. I mean, of, of course, if they believe Jesus is the fulfillment of the scriptures, they're going to be, as they're reading the scriptures, they're going to be looking back and saying, oh, this fits Jesus, this fits Jesus. But I think Luke really has much more of a sense of context than, than we often credit him for. And, and not everything that Luke does is talking about a one-to-one a, a -one correspondence. Uh, sometimes he's looking at the principles of the way God acts in history. If you look at Stephen's speech, you have uh, Joseph, who's rejected by his brothers, and yet he's raised up to be their deliverer. You have Moses, who's rejected by his, by his people, and yet... Mm -hmm. He's raised up to be a deliverer. So you have this pattern of rejected deliverers already throughout Israel's history. And mm -hmm. some of those patterns, I mean, like the pattern, you know, comparing Joseph and Moses, that's already in the Pentateuch. That's just good narrative criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and, and, you know, the fulfillment of Joel and so on. I mean, those, those are... Uh, Pretty obvious. I think Isaiah 53 is fairly obvious. It's it's cited in Acts chapter eight to the African court official. Mm -hmm. So uh, Luke, I think, handles scripture pretty well. You do have cases in some parts of the New Testament where you know they, they're dealing in polemical contexts. So somebody's quoting the scripture out of context, and they'll quote one back. You know, uh, that way, like you know, your mother, know your mother. Uh, Proverbs says, "Answer a fool according to their folly." But, but usually, if you look at the context, there's a reason for it. Sometimes it's just an analogy, but sometimes it's actually a messianic prophecy or, or something else. Um, I think what James does, people often criticize what James, uh, the brother of Jesus, does in Acts 15, where he quotes from Amos. And it's quoted in the Septuagint, but of course, Luke is writing in Greek, so you're going to expect Luke to quote the Septuagint in any case. Um, it's a matter of hospitality. They've got visitors who are Greek speaking there. The Jerusalem church hosted people who were uh, exclusive Greek speakers and, and those who spoke Greek and Aramaic. So it'd be natural for them to use a Greek translation. But even if they didn't, we sure. quote it. But in, in Acts 15, um, where he quotes the Septuagint, Septuagint translates not Edom, but Adam. Uh, so for all of humanity. But even if you even if you say, no, you can't do that. The parallelism shows that he's, you know, Edom is just an example. It's for all the nations. So James's application of that fits perfectly 
um, restoring the fallen tent of David, if that's referring to the, the dynasty, the Davidic dynasty, mm. well, I mean, if, if, if that prophecy would ever be re, uh, fulfilled, it can't be fulfilled now. Nobody knows who's descended from David now. Sure. But in the first century, yes, Jesus, Jesus fulfilled that. So, I mean, there's so much we could do, but yeah. And I'm sorry about the light. In, oh, it's, no. it, are you kidding me? We are all adjusting through this whole COVID thing, figuring <laughs> stuff out. Uh, it's been nice to see the transfiguration <laughs> somebody commented. We literally got to see Craig Keener transfigured before our eyes. So Lit up with, with <laughs> excitement for God's word. <laughs> hey, I, I, I personally want to thank you for coming on. Your work is just, it's so encouraging to me. It's so helpful. I look to it regularly in my writing, in my speaking, in my research. And I definitely want to encourage uh, viewers to see this live or later. If you want to study the Acts in depth, pick up a, a copy of his recent commentary uh, with the Cambridge Bible Commentary and just go chapter by chapter. In a month, you could basically get through it probably 20, 30 minutes a day and really get a grasp on the book of Acts. Um, if you've enjoyed this, give us a thumbs up. It helps us just kind of spread the word and let other people find out about the channel. And if you want to know more about apologetics and theology, think about studying with me at Biola. We have a distance apologetics program, and we go through a lot of the historicity of these issues, the Gospels. We look at Acts and read books by Keener and by others. And also, if you're not ready for Masters, we do have a certificate program. Where we will walk you through just kind of a formal way of learning apologetics in our department. And actually, for tuning in, if you go down to the description below, there's a discount code for you that will actually save you a good amount of money. So, uh, keep, Dr. Keener, hang on. Please don't uh, disappear yet. But I want to thank the rest of you. And there's no live stream this Sunday. But next week, have Randy Alcorn coming on. And we're going to talk. He's done a lot of work on heaven. So we're going to discuss the book uh, by Bart Ehrman on heaven and hell, what we can learn from it, and some of the ways that Alcorn sees it a little bit differently. So that'll be next Wednesday. You will not want to miss that. But God bless. Thanks so much for joining us.